journey, the journey, the journey. You just keep moving forward with what you're doing and life will show you what you want to do. Welcome back to The Journey. As always, we have an iconic Memphian here in our midst. <laughs> now, let me give you a little background on this gentleman. We're talking about Mr. Keenan Walker. Keenan is not only an artist, he's an actor. In addition to it, he's a great orator. And besides all that, there's no way you can tell me a young brother from inner city Memphis would end up to ascend to be the Peabody duck master. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, without further ado, we have Mr. Keenan Walker. What's hey, up, Keenan? Brother, man, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, man. I'm really excited about this. I appreciate it. Fantastic, fantastic. So you know this is the rapid fire round. All right, all so right. I want to know, give me the who. Who, besides your parents, had the biggest impact in your on your journey? Uh, Orlando Draper. Okay. Orlando Draper um, was a, a Memphis legend, gospel artist, but he was also my uncle. And because, oh. and because of him, uh, I, I learned to dream big, think outside the box, and uh, he was the example of what was possible in my life. What decision did have you made in your life that you didn't know at the time, but turned out to be a life-altering decision? Acting. Acting in and freestyling. Those two things became outlets to me. I mean, right. acting gave me the opportunity to step out of my own shoes and walk in another set of shoes and look at life through a different set of eyes, you know, because of the circumstances I came up with were kind of rough. Freestyling gave me a chance to expand my vocabulary, but also use words um, to fight for myself versus just my fists. Fantastic. All right. So moving right along, when did you know that you were going to be a success? You know, that's a great question. I mean, that, you know, my, I, I was blessed to have a mother and a grandmother and an uncle who, who always told me that I would be a success. I think I knew for myself once I got to a point to where I had done a play. Matter, matter of fact, I was 13 years old. My mother put me in a theater camp at the Alliance Theater Company in Atlanta, Georgia. I was getting in a lot of trouble during that point. But when I got on stage and was able to improv, and I got a reaction from the crowd based off of doing what I was natural for me to do. Uh -huh. I knew from there I found what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Wow, fantastic. Um, what drives you? What drives you? What's your why? Purpose. Okay. Purpose, you know, and, um, and legacy. I really think more in the mind state of I, I'm more concerned about what I'm remembered for leaving behind versus what I'm respected for or appreciated for while I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I, my grandmother always told me to leave a place better than it was prior to me being there. So I, as long as I feel like I've inspired, educated, and maybe, you know, um, inspired, uh, lifted somebody up along my journey, then that's what drives me. Okay. Now you're from Memphis. From Memphis. I'm South Memphis. All right. Born and raised. Well, born. Oh, but, mm, born definitely born. Here. born. Mm. Your early years were spent between Memphis and Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's correct. What did those communities give Kenan Walker? You know, it, Memphis, you know, is it, home. I think Memphis gave me the, the soul and the, and the spirit, you know, that uh, it, it's known for worldwide. Atlanta gave me the drive to to move a little faster, to to be involved in in things that were that were forward forward moving and bigger than me. Keep in mind, I grew up in Atlanta in the nineties. So I was there during, you know, So So Deaf. I was there during the Face Records. I was there during TLC, Criss Cross, you know, ABC, um, Usher, you know, Goody Mob, Outkast, you know, during the heyday of Atlanta. So being around that, that industry and that energy, that let me know what was possible. And I brought that energy back to Atlanta and kept that same mind state. I mean, brought back, back to Memphis and kept that same mind state. This is The Journey on the Kazookian Network, and we're fortunate enough to be speaking with actor, activist, artist, Keenan Walker. Um, how different are you, the dreams from your childhood as it relates to you today? So your dreams of who you would be, how different are, how different are you today from those dreams of your childhood? I would say it's not too far from what my original dreams were, but the reasons for why I do what I do have changed. I always wanted to, to be 
on stage, on screen, you know, making good music. I always wanted to do good work. But I think as a kid, you want to do it for fame. Everyone wants to be famous. As I got older, my, my reasons changed, and I wanted to do it to leave something behind that might inspire somebody. And I wanted to be an example of what was possible, regardless of where you come from, regardless if you come from the streets, or if you, or if you were privileged, which I was not. But the re- I, I put as much as I can in the work that I do so it can be an example to anybody, regardless of where you come from, of what you can do too. Fantastic. All right. I, um, this is a, a very powerful question, and it means a lot to me. Okay. Tell me the moment that you realized you were black. The moment I realized that I was black. Set the scene. My mother, uh, keep in mind, I come from a single mother. I'm a single, single parent household. I have an outstanding mother uh, named Teresa, Teresa Draper, and, uh, Teresa Brazell now, because she, she uh, got married about five years ago to an outstanding man named Ty Brazell. Now, she went to work and went to school at the same time while raising me. So a lot of time I spent with my grandmother, a lot of summers I spent here in Memphis while my mother was working at, at IBM and, and going to college and, and you know, to receiving degrees and building herself. i never forget we moved into, for the first time in my life, we moved into a predominantly white neighborhood. Okay, okay I was, I want to say 13, 13 years old. 13. Right. And... I remember, like, they, they, you know, I say, when I say a predominantly white neighborhood, come on, I'm in Georgia, so I mean predominantly redneck, like country white boy type neighborhood, all right? And I remember being called nigger to my face, like, by, and now, of course, you know, in our communities, we use the term. It, it has a completely different meaning. I mean, with the hard R, nigger, nigger. <laughs> you know I mean, being called that, like, to my face, but by a group of white boys. And I was just like, now me coming from where I come from, yeah, I was like, who, who you talking to? But it was just me. I remember coming home and KKK was bleached in our driveway, and every time it would rain, it you, it would it, it would it would get lighter. You could see it. I remember them spray painting nigger misspelled. Now it was only one G. It was only one G. It was Niger. Yeah, it was Niger. Yeah, yeah. right. It was spray it spray painted on on the, the, the step right by the mailbox in front of our house, all right? So, and I remember getting in a physical altercation, which I won. Oh, which I won. <laughs> which I won. A lot, a lot of those comments and a lot of stuff, that, that activity ceased from that point. I mean, but at the same time, I remember having to fight for my life only because I was black. Not because I had done anything wrong. Not because I had caused anyone else a problem. Only because I was black, and that was the first time that I had really been encountered with firsthand racism, and like violent racism, to where I had to fend for my life just because of being black. You know what I mean? And ever since then, society has constantly reminded me of that fact. I mean, I have to be mindful, just like the rest of us, you know, especially young black men, that we are born into opposition, where we're born into a place to where there's an expectation of us already that's a negative one. Before we even open our mouth, before we even walk out the door, people expect us to be less than instead of greater than. And I think it's been part of my purpose to, to prove the opposite. This is a journey with actor, activist, artist, duck master, <laughs> Keenan Walker. <laughs> we'll be right back. Funking up your airwaves and jamming the good information in your ear. Once again, it's Funky Politics. Funky Politics. Funky Politics. And we're back with the journey. And if you didn't know already after listening to the first segment that we have an iconic Memphian. Icon- it's, it's early in the iconic phase. So we got a long tail that we built. See, we're going to see a, a long arc on this individual. And that's uh, Mr. Keenan Walker, actor, activist, just an overall consummate order. Just a bad brother. Thank you, brother. So, Keenan, unpack that childhood. What was that childhood like? What was your family structure like at growing up? Well, well, childhood, you know, I mean, I had a loving family. I had a very, very loving family. Um, like I said, Orlando Draper was my uncle. Uh, my mother's name was Teresa Draper. Yeah. Her mother's name is Marie Draper. And, you know, no, I... Br- no brothers or sisters? I'm a single, uh, my only, uh, only child. Only so, child. Just me. 
Just me. So you know, it's a lot of time spent, you know, in front of the mirror, you know, you know, making faces and playing characters and this and that, or you know, wandering off past the stop sign that I never should have went past, and you know, you know, finding my way on my own. Right. But I had a loving family, but there, there wasn't a lot of resources. You know what I mean? Okay. So there were a lot of hardships. There was a lot of struggle, but at the same time, there was a lot of inspiration because you know, again, watching my uncle formed this choir, you know, for, uh, rehearsing down at Greater Community Temple in North, North Memphis, you know what I mean? And then and behind my grandmother's house, uh, rehearsing with the band. I saw saw that evolve into he's doing shows. And the next thing you know, he was on a tape. And, you know, keep in mind, now, this, this is the 80s. It's like late right. 80s, early 90s. Right. So I'm like, my, my uncle's on the cover of a tape. You got, he's got a cassette tape album out. He's got a tape. Wow. And then it went to CDs. And then the thing, you know, he was nominated for Grammys and winning Dub and Stellar Awards and this and that. So he was my inspiration. But it, I moved around a lot because of my mother's job. So I, I, I started here in Memphis as a kid. We moved to uh, Manassas. Hold on, let me ask you. Let me ask you mm-hmm. a quick question in there. Sure. I don't, I don't hear you mentioning anything about your pops. Well, that's because there's not much to mention, unfortunately, you know, which is, I think, is the same situation for a lot of us, especially us in our community. I did not, my father was never a big part of my life whatsoever, and the small parts that he was were not beneficial. Now, when I say that, he, 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 he had issues, substance abuse issues that he struggled with, or that he struggles with. That so your pops is still living? He's still alive, and now at this point, we, we have a relationship. Okay. And right, and, but we formed a relationship once I became a father. Once I became a father, because I didn't realize there was a burden that was on my shoulders that I needed to let go, so I wouldn't pass that on to my kid. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And then, of course, that's that's a different story. But I I didn't find I found out later in life at thirteen years old. Thirteen years old, I found out that he had two more kids. So I have a half brother and sister that I found out about later on. So my mom's like, you couldn't, you weren't here to take care of me. But you went on and had two more kids. Why? What? Found out he didn't take care of them either. All right. So my mother was, you know, what I'm saying I, I, when I say my, my mother was my mother and father at the same time. A lot of people say a, a woman can't teach a man to be a man, and to a certain extent, that's true. That's true. I had to venture out and try to find my way, and I got in a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. Tell us about one of those times you got in trouble. Oh man, when I say I got in trouble, man, I think I, unfortunately, growing up, a lot of people around me were taken violently. A lot of my cousins and uncles died. I, 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 the uncles, I, I had cousins and uncles died of cancer. Uh, Orlando died of kidney failure. I had a friend that killed himself over a girlfriend. I saw a best friend get hit in a, in the, the, by a car in the street and watched this man die. I mean, so I was encountered with a lot of death um, at a young, young age. So I think that I was expecting it for myself. Mm-hmm. I think I was limiting the the number of days that, that were meant for me, and I would put myself in reckless situations. I, I, you know, I was out here on these streets. I was really, really out here on these streets, and I was in situations where I shouldn't have survived them. Mm-hmm. I should not have survived them. I mean, but as I continued to survive these encounters and situations— I found that I must be here for some reason. Like God must be shielding me from What's something. The, what was the turning point? Do you have a, a a moment that you the light went on or off or whatever? However you want to characterize. Absolutely. It? Um, well, I can say as 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 a uh, as a teenager, I got in a lot of trouble. I'll never okay. forget that there was um, a situation where and and and. Honestly, like I said, this is when malls were popping. Blockbuster music was still open. Right. I think I was like 16 years old. A group of friends, my mom was skipping school, went into Blockbuster, and you know they stole a bunch of CDs, hopped in my car, and we took off, right? Right. Uh, the police, the police, you know, I guess with radio, they, they're chasing us down uh, South Cobb Drive, you know, in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Pull over in the middle of the street. Everybody in the car runs except for the person sitting next to me. I mean... One, the two people in the back seat, they take off. The one on the right, when he jumped out the car, he jumped right in front of an oncoming car. Just like that. All right, so I witnessed that. The rest, the, the, the other three of us well, you know, got locked up. I'm sitting in jail, in juvie at that point, and I'm realizing, like, what am I doing? Like, what, 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 what am I doing with my life, right? Not saying that's, that was a stopping point of me doing dumb stuff, but... As I got older, the reason for me coming back to Memphis was because I had I had gotten, I had gotten more trouble. I had five felonies hanging over my head. Five felonies. Five. 
Felonies. Five felonies, you know what I'm saying, for doing something stupid in Atlanta. Okay. All right? I left Atlanta to go to Senatobia, Mississippi to go to college to show the judge I was doing something positive in my life so she wouldn't send me away for 50 years. All right? Now, the reason that I was coming to, I went to Senatobia was to be closer to Orlando, to be under his influence. The apartment complex that I was going to move into on the campus was full on, during the semester that I was going to go. So I had to wait an additional semester. He died during that semester. So now I have this, these cases hanging over my head. My uncle, who was supposed to be the influence, who was supposed to be the turning point in my life, is now gone. I'm in Senatobia, Mississippi, a place I've never been by myself. And I'm frustrated. I'm depressed. I'm heavy. I mean, every, I feel like the world's turned against me. I'm mad at myself for decisions that I made. And then I felt like circumstances were thrown on me that I didn't deserve. I was 19 years old. My, my uncle used to have these music lovers conferences. You know what I mean? Every year, people from around the world would attend. The very last one was in 1999, which was the year after he passed. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in there. I think Dr. Bobby Jones, I just remember him, talk, he was there. It wasn't necessarily anything he said that moved me, but I just remember visually he was there, there was a few people there. And something overcame me, man. When I say the, the spirit overwhelmingly took control of me, and I realized I have used every option that I could make for myself to try to make my way. And I have completely failed in every avenue. Everything that I know to do for myself has not worked and has led me to my detriment. And I let go. I was like, God, do with me what you are going to do because I don't know what else to do. And I'm, and I'm tired of doing it. I'm tired of living. I'm tired of being here. And I broke down. I'm mean, going to say I broke down, man. It was like that that ugly, that ugly cry, snotting it, you know, <laughs> that, that ugly cry. You know what I'm saying? But when I got back up, when I stood back up, I, it was like a bird looking down at a chessboard where I could look down and strategically place my moves versus walking head on through them. And I had a different vision of how I was supposed to move. Now, of course, it was a journey as life is from that point. But that was the moment when I started thinking more spiritually and more purposely uh, driven versus just blowing in the wind and you know, just existing. I started living instead of existing. This is the journey. And we're listening to the journey of Mr. Keenan Walker. Keenan, looking back today to that kid that had to get up off the floor in Senatobia, Mississippi, what would you say to him back there? I would have told him then to not continue to, to take the chances that I continued to take. I mean, it wasn't like an overnight thing where I woke up, you know what I'm saying, from a sinner to a saint. It wasn't that. You know what I mean? It was just I had a, a a clearer vision of, you know, maybe I'm here for some kind of reason versus looking for somebody to do something for me. I think that's why I was so reckless. I was so exhausted with life, but was never in, uh, never had, the, I guess, the courage to try to take myself out. So I put myself in situations for someone else to do it for me. You know what I mean? So I would start fights with the biggest people. I was hanging around gangs, you know what I'm saying? I was in, in street fights. I've been in shootouts. I've been in, I've seen so much in my life. But I, I earned the nickname Slim Riggs. You know, right? Slim, I was always skinny. I was skinny with a big head. All right? Riggs came from Lethal Weapon, the movie Lethal Weapon. You remember you had Merton Riggs. Mel Gibson played Martin Riggs, who was a good guy, but he lost his wife. And he, he because of the pain that he felt, he was a lethal weapon. He was a good guy, but he could click at the, at the, the drop of a hat and become a lethal weapon. Right. I mean, I would have told, you know, that person, the young me then, to really start living and enjoying life at that moment versus having to go through more, some more things to, to really enjoy life. But I, could, but I can honestly tell you, I thought my cutoff point was 34. I thought 34 would be my cutoff point. Okay, so hold on now. The question was, what would you say to that guy this guy sitting here, mm -hmm. what would you say to that guy back then if you could talk to him? I would say to slow down and, and really live life instead of having su such a sense of urgency. I mean, I think I had a, such, a sense of urgency to accomplish a lot of stuff before 34 because I thought that was my cutoff age. So I was just work, I would work, I would work, I would work. And keep in mind, I was on probation. You know what I'm saying? I ended up doing, I ended up doing five years probation. Right? So my, my options were limited. I could not work certain places. I could not work at FedEx. I, I've worked at every factory in this city. Oracle Brothers, Darby, I've worked at Technicolor. I've been through every uh, temp agency. I had, my options were, were limited. You know what I mean? Because of your felonies. Because of, my, because of the felonies, right? Now, which, which thank God I now 
expunged and my record is clean. Now, now, but because of those lack of options, I had to find something. I had to find a way to make myself feel fulfilled. And that's when the music and the acting really started to, to I really took that seriously because it was, it kept me sane. So I would have told the younger me then to really start living and appreciating life now versus being so quick to do the next thing. Great segue. Tell me about your greatest successes. We've heard about some of the darker sides of your journey. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your greatest success to date. Uh, you know, it's hard to boil it down to one because um, I think God has brought me through so much and has allowed me to be an example in so many outstandingly um, tremendous ways. Um, I will say one of the biggest changing points for me, right, was, I want to say this was 2006. I believe it was 2006. I was acting as part of a living history tour at the National Civil Rights Museum. Keep in mind, I was on probation. Right? Mm-hmm. I was on probation at the time. I was playing this fictional character named Randy, who was on the bus and Rosa Parks wouldn't get up. I mean, so I had this little skinny tie on and the tam. And, and basically what it was, if there were actors in, in certain parts of the museum. And if you took this tour, one actor would come to life as a historical figure and then they'd pass you off to the next person. And you, that's how you would get through the museum. Well, I was sitting in the back, I was sitting in the back of the bus waiting on the group to come around. And I, then when the group came around, I'd hop off, you know, everybody got to see what's going on. Miss Parks, Miss Parks, she won't get up. And I teach people about the sit-ins and the bus boycott. But then as I was sitting inside that museum, waiting on these groups coming around the corner, I would read. I'd read. I'm like, let me read what's in this exhibit. Let me read what's inside this bus. And I would pick an exhibit a day. I'm like, I'm just going to read everything in one exhibit every day until I make it all the way through here. And that filled me with something that I needed at that time. Now, my mother always taught me the history. She always, always drilled it. Vacations were, were trips to plantations. I'm like, Mom, I don't want to go to another plantation. I'm sick of watching Uncle Tom's Cabin. I don't want to see Mandingo again. We've seen Roots a thousand times. I needed that then. I needed that. I didn't know then I needed it. But when I learned that history, it affected my performances. All right? And then next thing I know, a woman named Beverly Robinson, who was the, the president of the Civil Rights Museum, started taking notice of me, right? The performer, yesterday I was playing this guy named Randy, but she started taking notice of me. And the more I started, I started learning, the more I wanted to teach people. I was like, man, if I had known this back then, I might not have done so much reckless, stupid, just this disrespectful stuff. My people have been through so much just for me to be where I am. And I had the nerve to walk around my pants sagging and, and, and acting any kind of way and being out here on these streets doing whatever. It, it, it filled me with shame, but then it filled me with pride. And Beverly Robertson watched me go from this guy, from the slumping over, you know, kind of dragging to, to a man standing and walking. And she gave me an opportunity to stay on as a tour guide. And I was the, the tour guide who gave the tour to the Dalai Lama when the Dalai Lama came to Memphis. A wow. kid from South Memphis, you know what I mean, growing up in the streets of Atlanta, who been through, who's been through all the stuff I've been through. I took the Dalai Lama, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, on a tour through the National Civil Rights Museum where Dr. King gave his life. I was blessed with that opportunity. So it was at that moment that I knew, I'm like, you know what, okay, God, I see what you are doing. You, you, you're doing something with my life, but you're also making me an example based off of what I've been through of what's possible. This is the journey. And you are learning about the journey of Mr. Keenan Walker. Keenan, young boys, young men are watching you, are watching this interview. What would you say to them to inspire them to give themselves a chance? All, all I know to say is what has worked for me, and that is to do what makes you feel fulfilled or what makes you feel like I did that today. You know what I mean? I did that today. And when I say that, I mean, we, because we a lot of times don't know that we have a purpose, then we follow other people. We look to other people for guidance. We get involved in certain influences. We get involved in things that our brothers and, and our, our friends and everyone else or our, or our parents got involved in. We fall into things that, we're, we're taught to us versus what we found to be for us. I mean, when you realize 
that you were created for something. Now, everybody has a purpose. Everyone's pur- purpose is different. But once you tap into what that is, then you become an example versus a follower. Now, a lot of times our purpose is not what we want it to be. It's not cool. It's not what everybody else is doing. And it will cause criticism from those who don't understand that. If people are criticizing you for you doing what you naturally feel like you're supposed to do, celebrate that. Because they're going to see the flip side of it. People criticize what they don't understand. All right? People, when I was acting, when I was doing plays, I'm saying, and I'm out here on these streets, how you think I was looked at? People are like, you doing plays? Bro, you don't think, come on, bro, you doing plays? But those plays, learned, they, they led me to other opportunities. You know what I mean? And, and it led me to finding myself and, and then eventually going from teaching history to making history. All right? But I had to take the criticism. I had to take the, the, the folks talking behind my back. I had to take the rumors. I had to take all that. But I was being talked about. If somebody's talking about you, then be, hey, you're, you're worth talking about. Nobody criticizes anybody who's not doing anything worth talking about. So don't worry about what people got to say about you. People are going to talk about you, whether it's good or bad. But as long as you're the topic of conversation, then take pride in that. But step away from what other people are doing, especially if you know in your spirit, in your, in, in, in your, your stomach, you know what I'm saying? I, I shouldn't be doing this. That's, that's intuition. You, that's a, that's a God put that in you. I mean, he gave you a spirit of discernment. I mean, that's a trigger. Like, if you don't feel right doing it, if you, have, if you feel sick by doing it, that's not for you. But there's a balance to that, too. There's something that you can do that will make you feel fulfilled. It could be cutting grass. It could be the way you mop the floor. But you're looking at that floor, man. Whoa, I mopped. Look how shiny the floor is, man. Whoa, I did that. I did that. Search for the things that make you feel like that are worthy of you saying, I did that. I don't care if you get paid for it or not. And I guarantee it will connect to something else. And that'll connect to something else. But you got to see it in yourself first. And you've heard it from Mr. Keenan Walker. Keenan, thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey on the journey. Listen, this is your host, Larry Robinson. And uh, we're going to keep bringing them to you. We're going to keep bringing them to you. That's our mission on the journey. So uh, with that, Mr. Walker, thank you. And uh, come back. Because we're going to keep bringing these super duper Memphis icons on the journey on the Kazookian Network. Take care. The journey hosted by Larry Robinson, executive producer, the Delta Boulay.